All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for the U.S. Concrete Pavement Research and Innovations webinar. Uh, this is a joint uh, venture with Concrete Ontario and the Cement Association of Canada. There was lots of interest for the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario to host this webinar. Um, so we were able to come through and uh, we're very excited to um, welcome Dr. Peter Taylor today to give a great overview of what's happening in the U.S. on the concrete pavement uh, side. As always, uh, for most of these webinars, uh, it's myself, Alan Carey, Director of Technical Services, Concrete Ontario, and uh, Tim Smith, uh, Senior Director of the Built Environment, Transportation and Public Works from the Cement Association of Canada. So good morning, Tim. Uh, we're gonna be facilitators again. Uh, it's not our first time, so morning, hopefully Alan. you know what well, we're doing. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> So Tim, this 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 webinar really came out of uh, you know discussions with the MTO, and they're really in interested in it. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I think the MTO has always been very innovative in uh, wanting to learn new innovations that are happening, and uh, want to learn about new research that's occurring in concrete pavements. Exactly. Um, and before we do get to our presenter, uh, I'll just run through some housekeeping items just to make sure everybody's aware of how everything's going to work today. Uh, it will be approximately a 45 minute webinar. We'll have uh, questions and answers at the end. All participants are muted. So if you do have a question, please use the uh, GoToWebinar questions pane on the right side of your screen and you can type in your questions. We will address all the questions at the end just to keep things moving along. Um, for anybody that isn't able to join us today. This webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be posted on the Concrete Ontario website along with a copy of the PDF um, of the presentation. So that should be up by approximately tomorrow afternoon. Uh, a follow-up email is always sent a uh, day after. So you will have the link and you will have all that information in case you're not able to stay for the entire webinar today. Now, in terms of the CP Tech Center, if you're not aware of it, um, Tim will talk about it next by introducing our um, presenter. But for myself, when I started in concrete pavements about five or six years ago now, this is the name that came up throughout the industry always and continuously. Uh, the materials they produce are second to none. And on top of that, they're all free. So for example, the integrated materials and construction practices for concrete pavement um, manual, it's a fantastic document if you are getting into concrete pavements. I know I found it very, very useful. They also have all sorts of different resources like concrete pavement distresses, overlays. Um, so make sure you check out their website um, for all these fantastic documents. Now, Tim, you've known uh, Dr. Peter Taylor for a very long time. Um, <laughs> and so I'll kick it over to you to introduce our presenter for today. Thank you very much, Alan. And yes, I agree. The CP Tech Center, uh, the information that they have on there is fantastic. It's some of the best research that you'll see in concrete and some of the most practical as well. When you look at uh, things, even like the roller compacted concrete guide that was developed in, and is on that website as well. So there's a lot of very good information on, on that website. So I recommend everybody take a look at that uh, after the session or sometime in the next in the near future. Uh, yeah, yes, Dr. Peter Taylor. I've known Dr. Peter Taylor for a long time. He's a very close personal friend, and he's actually one of the most knowledgeable pe people that I know uh, in the concrete pavements, materials, construction, and actually the pavement defects uh, and forensic investigation pavements. Uh, he's very good in that in, 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 uh, and very well known, not only in North America, but all across the world. He does uh, webinars for worldwide. Peter's the director. Um, of the National Concrete Pavement Technology Center at Iowa State University. He's involved in conducting projects and programs investigating materials related to aspects of concrete pavements. He also spends time helping agencies and contractors implement best practices for concrete pavement design, construction, and maintenance. His research is focused on developing mixtures that are engineered to meet the requirements of the environment that will be used, it will be used in. And that's very important nowadays when we're looking at the greenhouse gases emissions. So we wanna minimize the amount of cement content in your mix to optimize that design so that you minimize the, uh, the footprint of your pavement. He's a professional engineer registered in Illinois and uh, active in a number of professional societies, including the International Society for Concrete Pavements, which is another very good organization. And I'd suggest that you take a look at that, the information that's on that website as well. Thank you very much, and Peter, take it away. And thank you for uh, doing this presentation for us. We really and truly appreciate it. 
Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Tim and Alan. And uh, yeah, that's quite a build up you've given me. So that's kind of intimidating. Let's hope that I meet, meet your expectations over the next 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, you've already stolen a couple of my slides. So yeah, we'll, we'll chew through this and have a lot of fun as we try and go through it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about innovations in concrete pavements, both the work that we're doing, some research needs, and uh, some of the stuff that uh, we are re implementing and working on in the research community. So for the, again, <coughs> just sort of starting with who the CP Tech Center is, uh, our buzzword is we think we make a difference. We're trying to make your lives better as practitioners, regardless of, of who you work for or what side of the table that you're sitting on. And we target ourselves as being useful in communicating and interacting with agency, industry, and academia. So we're at that nexus where all three of those groups meet. And that's reflected in our staffing, is that I'm a pseudo-academic, I'm a, a, a research professor at the university. Uh, a couple of the directors that work with me are, come from the industry side of the conversation, having spent years with trade associations. And uh, John Adam, is, uh, pre his previous job was as uh, chief engineer at Iowa DOT. So he brings the, the voice of the agency to all of our conversations. And that's, we think, is a strength because it means that, you know, when we're thinking and talking about stuff, we can get all three of us or, or all of us representing the different ways of thinking. How do we do this? Problem solving, implementation, doing good things. One of the things that we do claim is that we're not in the world of uh, advocacy. That's Tim and Alan's job. My, our job is to provide them with the resources. Uh, and at the end of the day, once the decision has been, mil been made to build or maintain a concrete pavement, we'll help you with the tools and the guidance that you need to do it really well. Um, so primarily technical products in the form of publications. Uh, we do a lot of education, activities like this, getting on the web, traveling. You know, we used, I used to spend three weeks of every month on the road going somewhere and teaching about latest and greatest in concrete. COVID put that to bed. Uh, it's it's starting to wake up again. Um, I had three inquiries yesterday for in-person visits around the U.S. Uh, so uh, have to get used to getting on airplanes again. I'm not sure if I want to do that or not. You know, the education part is fun. The airports are not. Uh, we also like to think that we're presenting independent expertise, is that we're not beholden to any given industry or product. Is we, we'll call it as we see it, and we think that helps. Uh, in our communication. We are also try to be present at professional societies. Uh, so ACI has been running all of this week, ASTM, ASHTO, TRB, and a lot of local organizations as well. We try and be at so that we can hear what's happening in the community around us, as well as help with the education and dissemination of good information. We do a limited amount of research. I've got five PhDs working for me at the moment. It's all very applied. Uh, we're not focusing on the theory or the fundamentals. We're, we're focusing on, well, here's what we know. How do we get it into place? What do we have to change in our day-to-day -day thought? I had a question from a marketing geek the other day. What would be our message? How do we do our marketing? And our goal as we were conversing was that we want to be at the top of your minds so that you know to come to us when you need help, when things are going well, when you're planning something new, when something's going bad, call us. We can probably find the help. Again, our organization is pretty small. There's only about six of us, but we have access to consultants and experts all over the country and indeed around the world, as Tim alluded to. So we've got friends and relationships within people in South Africa, Europe, Australia, South America. Um, so, you know, that, that breadth of, of relationships is also pretty huge. Is if we can't answer the question, we know someone who can. All right, Alan already threw up some of the pr 
products that we have produced, and I'm kind of glad I didn't have the same slide. I actually had it and then deleted it yesterday when I was polishing this session. Here are three either recent or about to be produced uh, publications. On the left, uh, one on quality control. This is one that Mike Kroll from FHWA has been dreaming of for at least five years. Tara Cavallini with uh, Al Innes and Gary Fick got together, have produced this, that's about 40 pages, guidance for the industry on how to do quality control and for the agency on how to roll it into their own quality management plans. <coughs> uh, I'm really excited about this document too. It's, we had it laid up uh, literally early this week. It went back to the authors on Monday for their final review. So hopefully, if all goes well, it'll be on our website uh, within a week or two. Uh, so look out for that. The fourth edition of Concrete Overlays is also finding its way through the process that's also been through the review and is back with the authors for a final check. Uh, authors primarily being uh, Mark Snyder and Gary Fick. Um, and a slight change in the thought process in this one. One of the big things we changed was instead of starting with the decision of is it bonded or unbonded, we start with the question of, well, what are you putting it on? Because that's the obvious place. You know, as an owner, you can't change what's down there already. So the first question is, is it an asphalt system or is it a concrete system that you want to do the work on? Then we go to look at the condition of it. And then based on that input, we can make a decision of should it be bonded or unbonded? And then the conversation runs. Um, so that's a fairly significant change in the way we label things and think about them. That is going to be, again, hopefully coming out reasonably soon. Uh, the third one is an update on the preservation guide written primarily by Kurt Smith. Uh, and again, the latest and greatest in this technology. That one is running a little behind these other two publications, but it's on its way out pretty soon. So watch, watch our website. We will be putting out um, press releases when they hit the streets. For those of you who don't have time to chew on a 40 page document, we've got the cliff notes. So once a month, at least, we put out tech briefs or map briefs, which are the you know, 10 page summaries, again, of where we're headed with um, new information. There is a new, we have two newsletters that go out. One is what we are up to, and the other one is what other people are up to. And these map briefs normally go with the latter one, which is news of what research or what activities or what reports other people are producing that we think is interesting. So again, all available on our website. I think I have a QR code further on, so get your cameras ready and you can shoot it, which will take you straight to our website uh, when you need to. The other product that we do put out is uh, spreadsheets because you know, we're engineers, we like to play with numbers. So the two that seem to be getting the most attention is the one on the left is one produced by uh, Jeff Ressler and Amanda Bordelon, which is how to design mixtures or how to do the structural design if you're incorporating fibers in your mixtures. Uh, so it's based on the concept of residual strength. Uh, Jeff and Amanda put this together two or three years ago. It's a free download. I actually had an inquiry from a DOT last week. They want to put it on their own website. Uh, and were there any copyright issues? The answer was no, carry on. Um, so that, that one is finding some traction. The other one is a tool that I developed on mixed proportioning. And I'll talk a little bit about the philosophy behind it later. But the idea of you know, a, a different way of thinking about how to do mixture proportioning uh, that is a little bit more logical uh, with current tools, the ability of computers to do 10,000 iterations at once. Uh, so we, we think it produces a better mixture at the end of the day. So that is also a free download. This one has been adopted by Wisconsin. They uh, provide a uh, a benefit to contractors that adopt it. And so again, it seems to be working. When they, Wisconsin, Wisconsin first put this up on their website, I was kind of terrified. I was 
waiting for contractors because you know Wisconsin's just across the border. It's only a three-hour drive to my office, and I was waiting for them to pitch up with weapons. But no one has so far. In fact, one contractor tells me he's saving a lot of money. I've asked him for a commission. The check apparently is still in the mail. It's been about a year. All right, here's that QR code I promised you. We get quite a lot of activity on our website. You can see from the map, a lot of it is in the US and Canada. Uh, but interestingly, Europe, Southern Africa, China, Australia, people all over the world are indeed looking at our products which is kind of encouraging. This is good messaging for us when we go back to our sponsors and say, yeah, we do think you're getting value for money, that we are making life, the life easier for people, particularly in the US, because those are the people that give us money, but uh, we are impacting life around the world. So that's kind of an encouraging, makes us feel good about ourselves. The other part of what we do is education. Uh, the big one at the moment, again, when COVID shut down travel, we all looked around the room and said, what are we going to do? How do we keep our activities going? And the obvious answer was to run a webinar. So we teamed up with ACPA. They provide the technology. Uh, and we've been hosting monthly webinars for, I think, we're the, the 19th one was the last one we did. And we've covered all sorts of topics from safety, uh, Disabilities Act uh, compliance, roller compacted concrete. The one I did last week was man versus machine. How do we instrument machines to make, <coughs> to report back how the mixture is performing and help the operator make decisions on how to control his machine? All of those, all 19 of them have been recorded. They're all online. What we normally try and do is we have some sort of expert talk about what they know. And then we also have somebody from an agency somewhere come in and talk about how they've adopted what we're talking about and how it hasn't killed them. You know, they're still alive. Their pavements are getting better. And this one that I took a screenshot of was Arizona DOT, who don't build a lot of concrete pavements. Their uh, pavement engineer got on the on this webinar and said they really like their concrete pavements because they're quiet. And I could hear all of the people like Tim jumping up and down in the background going, hell yes. <laughs> uh, you know, to have someone from a DOT talk about quiet concrete pavements uh, is actually kind of you know, exciting and encouraging. So again, keep track of that. The last one, I think we had eight countries represented, including typically Manitoba, sign on and occasionally people from Ontario join us. So that, that's all good. Uh, we also get involved with, we help manage the National Concrete Consortium. This is primarily focused on agencies getting together, uh, but at the same time, industry and suppliers and uh, manufacturers come to the meeting, but it's primarily focused on agencies to, to get together. Uh, people from Manitoba came for a while. Again, COVID and budgets mean they haven't joined us as often, but uh, it was always good to have uh, Archie with us when he could make it. Typically, it's 150 people when we do face-to-face. -face. The last couple of meetings have been uh, online, and, it, and that's the conundrum we're trying to figure out how to deal with as we move forward. 150 people face to face is great because you get to talk, you, you get to meet over the coffee machine and argue with each other and converse and brainstorm stupid ideas. When it's online, you lose that personal interaction, but we're also getting a lot more people engaged. So whether we go with hybrid, how we play this going out into the future as we crawl out from our caves, I'm not too sure. The next meeting is, ooh, this is an updated slide, I'm sorry. The next meeting is on April 4th in um, Nashville uh, in 2022. So my apologies for not updating uh, this slide. Uh, we also do workshops. We've got all sorts of presentations, sessions. You can read the topics for yourself on the slide. Those are all in the can. We're ready at a very short notice to come and either do it online or to come and spend a day with you. Uh, if, it, if we're traveling, we have to figure out how we pay for it. Um, this image, uh, I actually think Tim took this photograph. It was a screenshot of the ISCP conference that we had a couple of weeks ago. 
Uh, I'm on the yellow shirt lurking around in the back there, moderating the session on performance engineered mixtures. Presenting at the time was Mike Pro. Uh, so again, you know, there are tools to make it. Try and find that compromise between interaction and boring screen time. All right, so getting away from what we do, let's look at some of the fun stuff we've been playing with. A very big one in our lives is the idea of performance engineered mixtures. And What's intriguing is that, in a way, this has reached a, a certain level of maturity. It's a bit like my teenage kids. They've moved out, they've hit the world, they're doing their own thing, they're not answerable to me except when they want more money, uh, but they're also doing good things. And uh, that's what we're seeing with PEM. The fundamental philosophy behind the program was, let's write specifications that call for the things that we really need. So we started with getting a bunch of experts together and bickering for four days over a period of a year and finally agreeing that there are six properties that really matter. Permeability, aggregate stability, resistance to cold weather, strength, shrinkage, and workability. I had some feedback from someone from Florida last week saying, well, we don't care about cold weather, we don't care about PEM. And I was, pretty restrained in my response saying, yeah, but you have issues with the other five properties. Uh, it's not just cold weather. Uh, but, and this again, started life focusing on pavements, but we're seeing that it's starting to make an impact, particularly on the bridge community. And fundamentally, I mean, concrete is concrete. And so for the structural community, we're starting to hear that we can make a difference in that world as well. In fact, I had a structural engineer called me up last week and say, how do we get this education in front of the structural community? And I, I said, you know, we, we've got the tools, we've got the know-how, we've got the, the resource, we've got everything that we need. We need the money to be able to get out there and figure out how do we interact? What group do we engage with to get this thought process in front of the structural community? So if you guys have any thoughts on that, Alan, Tim, you know, Tim, you're focused on pavements, but you know, let's, let's keep that conversation going. We're starting to hear the need. The next part of that, figuring out, okay, here are the critical properties. The, the next question was, how do we measure them? And that's when we went back to the research community and said, okay, here are the six critical properties. How do we measure them? And they stepped up. They provided us with the tools, with the test methods that allowed us to be able to measure these properties, both in the lab and in the field, the photograph is a trip. I'm not even sure which one it was. We've got a little 14 foot trailer that's fully equipped with everything we need to do all of these tests in the field. And so we can come to you, we can demonstrate them, we can get on a real construction site and show you how your mixtures are performing. We can also get your materials, go back in the lab and see, can we tweak your mixtures to perform even better and probably at lower cost and I'll, I'll get around to that on the mixture side. Uh, and so, you know, part of the program has been this thought of how do we, it's, it's not in the specification on, it's not recipe based on how to make the mixture, but in the background, we do have the tools to help you prepare mixtures that meet the six critical properties or the ones that you need. Uh, you know, shrinkage in cold weather climates tends to be low on the priority list but we can certainly help you with the cold weather stuff. Um, so uh, the work is ongoing. We've got another year or so of the pool fund and we're looking to planning the second phase of PEM where we're gonna start looking at implementation. Uh, once the concrete has left the truck, uh, how do we monitor it, and measure it and control it? So the innovative test methods, I'm sure you've all heard about them before. The V. Kelly test for measuring how a mixture responds to vibration. This is the latest iteration of that machine. <coughs> we had it out in the field last week, and uh, it seems to be reporting pretty accurately. You know, if the mixture changes, and we can make mixtures with the same slump and different responses to work to vibration, and it's the latter that actually matters to the contractor because he's got to get it through the paving machine, get it flat and level and well finished. Uh, the resistivity test for telling us how well it's going to perform in terms of uh, durability and the super meter for telling us about the airvoid system. And again, there's a lot of data, a lot of presentations about how all of these things are run.
but they're starting to find some traction among the agencies in their specifications and among the contractors for, own, for their own quality control processes. The other innovative tool that is starting to find some traction are the real-time smoothness devices. There are two commercially available. Again, the side I was on had uh, one of them mounted on the back of their paver. And in speaking to the foreman, we said to him, so is this worth the money? And his reaction was, oh yeah, uh, knowing almost immediately how the, the, the pavement is coming out in terms of smoothness, which is tied to their bonuses. You know, the crew all of a sudden has instant feedback on what do they have to adjust, how, what do they have to change to make sure that the pavement as it's, as it's being delivered is as smooth as they can get it. And uh, that feedback loop is encouraging the, the team, the crew, to do everything they can, which is great from the agency, because at the end of the day, they're getting pavements with way better smoothness which means you've got happy customers. Uh, drivers riding on the road are not complaining about the ride or the, or the, the, the noise. Um, and it's also contributing to the longevity, is that starting smooth, we've got a long way to go of deterioration before we have to do anything to correct any uh, blemishes or uh, lack of smoothness later on in time. So again, there's a program out there, there is some money, now, I'm not sure whether or not we could make it to Canada, but we have tools in place that we can come and bolt a machine onto a paving machine, test it out for you, demonstrate it. The life cycle that I've observed is that day one, when we bolt it onto someone's machine, the contract is kind of leery. What are you doing to me? Day two, they start to look at the screen and figure out, oh, wait, this is useful. Day three, they tell us, where do we buy it? Uh, and so, you know, the contractors are liking it, those that have installed it on their equipment. Other implementation activity we're doing, we have a contract with FHWA, it's fairly big money, a lot of information. In fact, those three publications I showed you at the beginning of the slideshow are all built out of, are all products out of this program. Uh, and there's a lot more to come, addressing the fundamental needs of the contracting and the owner agency communities. The other one that's uh, been in place for a year, but we're starting to get some traction with it, is a cooperative agreement with the FAA. And this one's focused on research. The FHWA program is focused on implementation. I'm not allowed to do any research. But the FAA has stepped up with a fairly large bucket of money. Um, and the first four RF, three RFPs have been issued. One, two of them have closed and we're in the process of reviewing those RFPs. The third one is still open. The fourth one is going to come out in a couple of weeks when I write it, and three or four more to come after that, meeting the needs of the airfield community. Uh, and while concrete pavements are concrete pavements, the airfield community has slightly more stringent re requirements because they are concerned about FOD, which highways are not. Also, when you're putting down a pavement that's 18 inches high, the workability requirements are slightly different. And that's one of the proposals that's under review at the moment is how do we take the tools that we've already developed for highways and modify them to be useful for far thicker pavements, far more sensitive to uh, durability issues and uh, that sort of thing. So ASR proportioning, rapid repair quality are the ones that are in process. The next one likely to come out is gonna be on rubber removal and there will be more coming out in the future. So watch this space if you have teams that want to bid on these proposals. Uh, we are managing these. I'm kind of frustrated that I can't bid on them. a couple of them. I'd love to, but uh, I get to manage the process instead. One of the things that's come out of the PEM program is trying to correlate mixed proportioning with those six critical properties. And as I said, we have in the background, we've developed these tools, we've started to understand what it levers that we cool, can pull. Uh, and it's actually kind of cool talking to a Canadian audience because I don't have to say levers, I can say levers and you understand me. Um, that you know, the things that we can address to make a mixture meet all of those critical properties and at the same time be as sustainable 
and as low cost and as durable as we can possibly get them. And so we're starting to get a good handle of that. We think we've got some good answers. The, the proportioning is based on this concept that we need to understand, we need to control the volume of paste to uh, provide us the workability we need. And again, traditional specifications talk about 564 pounds of uh, 300 kilograms, 400 kilograms per cubic meter of, of, of cement to meet performance. And that's not quite right because it depends on the aggregate system. And this is illustrated with this little figure that the blue square is the same area as the blue in between the aggregate particles. And you can see that if we get adjust the gradation slightly, the volume of paste that we need to fill up the space between those aggregate particles goes down. And that's logical. And the fundamental is that we need to fill the space between the particles and a little bit more to separate them so that we're gluing them together and to make sure that we've got workability by controlling it, the gradation, we can reduce the amount of paste in the system and still provide or improve the properties of the mixtures. The one part that we still don't know is the effects of aggregate shape and aggregate mineralogy. I have a student chewing on this. He's in the middle of making a 150 odd trial ba or batches in the lab, trying to get a, a, how we can put numbers to if I've got a coarse aggregate that's uh, crushed limestone compared to a river gravel. Uh, and the numbers are different and we need to be able to predict those rather than having to do a whole bunch of uh, trials in the lab. The other topic we're paying a little bit of attention on and uh, I know that's of great interest to you guys is salt scaling. I remember when I first visited uh, Toronto with Doug Hooten, uh, back in 1995, I remember walking around Toronto City with Doug and pointing out sidewalk walks that we're in trouble with salt scaling. And we're still chewing on this topic. I had a PhD do a whole bunch of work. And one of the interesting things that he picked up was he was focusing on slag and that he found that, you know, typically when we, we see issues with slag cement in a scaling environment, Everybody starts talking about, well, it didn't gain strength fast enough. It's not, per the permeability is wrong. Or uh, the finishing, the bleeding had an effect. And those are all true. But what we found is that as we did things under controlled conditions in the lab, is that mechanical performance got better with the slag in the mix. Resistance uh, to chemical attack, the permeability got better. Yes, there was an issue that we had to control the finishing a little bit better, but abrasion got better, strength got better, but scaling resistance got worse. And it's starting you know, the chart of sorption, abrasion, uh, compression all got better while the scaling resistance got slightly worse with increasing dosage of slags. And it, it made me start to wonder, maybe it's a chemical effect. And uh, so I've got another student who's a guy, a guy I recruited out of chemical engineer because uh, most civil engineers hate chemistry. So I went and found a kid who actually likes working with chemical stuff. And he's fooling around right at the moment. And what he's beginning to, to find is that some of the minor compounds in the slag may be interacting with the de-icing salts. And uh, we haven't completed this work. He's probably got another year or two to go. But I, I think we're on to something here. And so watch this space. We will be following up with some more information as it firms up in the future. A, product we a project that we finished fairly recently was investigating air void systems. We're doing a TRB presentation on all of the details, a project we did with uh, John Kevin uh, from University of Kansas City, uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City. And uh, working with me here at CP Tech was Hamid Sadati, who now works at uh, Caltrans. We did three parts to this project. We did, we went out and got cores and samples, or we got other people to collect cores and samples from all over the place, including from Ontario. And I want to thank you guys again for providing us with the information from your own program that we could fold it into this work. Uh, Manitoba also provided us with some cores. Uh, what was intriguing is we were looking for sites where freeze-thaw due to poor air void systems 
was the primary cause of failure. And to me, a loud signal out of that was that it was a struggle to find that. Whenever we got calls back, there was one in, in Missouri. The, the materials engineer in Missouri said to me, I've got the site, it's perfect. We know the air was bad, the pavement's falling apart, this is it, come and sample it. So we went down, we pulled cores out of it, we did a whole bunch of testing. Yes, the air was pretty poor, but fundamentally the cause of the failure was alkali silicon rush. And this seemed to be the case in most of the places where we went, failure wasn't just freeze thaw, it was other stuff on top of marginal air void systems. Uh, and so, you know, it's politically incorrect, but I'm sort of wondering if we are blaming air for a lot of other problems. Uh, and so I'll let that conversation float out there. Then we came back in the lab and we, we evaluated other test methods. We, we did a, a lot of mixtures with uh, different binder types and contents, and we were evaluating the super air meter and uh, the scanner, uh, Larry Sutter's approach and uh, Carl Peterson's approach to measuring air void systems in hardened concrete samples and found that, yeah, the test methods, training is necessary, calibration is necessary, but they do produce reasonably repeatable results that can be useful. John Kevin's work was to do freeze-thaw testing, both scaling and freeze-thaw in some of the mixtures that we identified as being pro uh, problematic. Um, and basically what we found was that the test methods that we're using are pretty good. Uh, and in some cases, we believe that the, the cutoff prop, uh, parameters that we have, the limits that we have, may be slightly conservative, and that's not all bad. So if you want to learn more about this, John and Hamed are going to be joining me on a, a TRB webinar sometime next week, and you can get into a lot more of the detail of that project. The other one that we're looking at quite heavily is internal curing, the idea of putting little bubbles of water in the middle of the concrete, which isn't part of the original water cement ratio. It's encapsulated uh, and is released back out. The, the fundamental benefit being is that we then get a better distribution of curing water, the blue area in this image, uh, that it's, it's better distributed. So you don't get differentials between top and bottom, uh, and it also enhances hydration. Um, so I've been interested in this. Uh, I've done a lot of bridge decks, and uh, what we found is that by doing combinations of good mixture design, good supplementary cementing materials dosage, and internal curing, and rigorous external curing, we can make a bridge deck that has marginal, very little cracking. Uh, we're just setting off on another project for another state where we're going to be doing this more extensively, but this was a higher we built, a, I think it was a five-span bridge, um, two-lane. Eastbound was conventional, westbound was with the mixture that we developed, and the westbound still has very little cracking in it. And Ohio is starting to adopt this philosophy in their, their bridge decks. Where I was intrigued with the idea in, in pavements was uh, that if we can get rid of that differential of moisture content between top and bottom, we can reduce the warping. And therefore, we can reduce the risk of early age cracking because of warping. We can reduce all sorts of problems. You know, we can put thinner overlays on a pavement because at the moment, the slab size is controlled by warping. And if we can reduce the warping, we can keep the saw cuts out of the wheel path. Duh. Uh, so we've built two pavements here in Iowa. Uh, and this is just one plot of all of the terabytes of data we have showing pretty clearly is that the, the internally cured slabs are indeed moving a whole lot less, both in terms of thermal effects and moisture effects. So my hypothesis was right. We've demonstrated that it's working. We're going to be watching the smoothness of these pavements over time to see if it stays that way. But right at the moment, we're, we're pretty satisfied is that these things are staying flatter longer, and that's altogether a good thing using internal curing. The challenge with internal curing is that if you use lightweight, fine aggregate, getting it may be a challenge. Is the nearest supply from us is uh, 500K away. Uh, and then stockpiling it and controlling it is that you have to pre-soak the aggregate for three days. And the contractors are happy enough to do that on relatively small cores like a bridge deck or a quarter mile test section. But if you're doing 
you know, 10 kilometers of pavement, that's an awful lot of material you have to stockpile and precondition. So we're just starting out on a project. I had a student start last month where we're going to be looking at the idea of super absorbent polymers um, that we could dose into the mixture a bit like an admixture. And so we don't have the whole stockpiling issue. Interestingly enough, you know, th this works in the bar or when you meet people at social events and they say to me, what are you doing with that's innovative with concrete? And I say to them, I, I'm putting kitty litter or diapers into, mix, into concrete mixtures and it's making it better. That's normally good for a couple of beers while people try and figure out what I'm talking about. Next up, fibers, uh, particularly with overlays. Uh, <coughs> we've built a few test sections. Minnesota's done a, a couple of test sections with fibers. And here in Iowa, where we've done a few, we've got a couple of county engineers that really like the idea. Minnesota went whole hog. They build a traffic circle. It's in the middle of nowhere with no, fib with no joints in it and fibers. We're in the process of writing up the final report. We've been tracking it for three years. It has cracked, not surprisingly. The cracks didn't happen at where they did initiating saw cuts, uh, but we're thinking that maybe those saw cuts were not quite deep enough or long enough. The cracks at the moment, we were up there about a month ago, are about five millimeters wide at the worst. So we are losing some load transfer, but thus far it's performing pretty well. It's carrying the traffic, there's no distress, uh, and it's three years old already. And so would they build another one? Maybe not, or if they do, they may change the way they think about it. But hey, that was kind of fun to watch the circle go in and to keep an eye on it over, over a period of time. We built another suite where we did different thicknesses, fiber dosages, and we were monitoring when do these things um, uh, activate the joints. And there's a whole report out there, there's a bunch of data. What we did find is that the shorter panels did not activate quite as enthusiastically. Fibers didn't seem to make a lot of difference on activation, but the engineer owner of this pavement is telling me is he's still seeing very little faulting, even on the ones that have had reflective cracking coming through or other random cracking, cracking occurring. So he's fully committed to the idea that fibers help maintain ride and he's planning to keep using fibers in all his future mixtures. That same engineer was prepared to let us do a uh, oh, 300 meter length with no joints at all. It was an overlay between two bridges and we just let it crack out randomly. Uh, we, again, this is about two years old. Uh, Dan King is up there this week having another look at it. Uh, but again, we had to, we doubled the amount of fiber, so we had to change the mix design a little to make sure we still had workability. But again, using the tools that we had, that worked pretty well. Uh, cra average crack spacing at the moment is about 10 meters, uh, and crack width at worst is about a, uh, three, four millimeters. Uh, so again, faulting is not an issue, uh, and this seems to be performing reasonably well. Uh, so again, it's something that we're going to keep an eye on. The fibers in this case were the uh, um, polypropylene composite type material commercially available. Uh, we're also looking at geotextiles in interlayer. Instead of putting a an inch of asphalt underneath an overlay, Let's put geotextiles down. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot faster. Uh, we've been looking at the thermal effects, and the geotextiles indeed can have a pretty significant effect on keeping the system cooler, which indeed will help with random cracking. There is uh, an insulation benefit, which we're also starting to look at. Uh, we put down a pavement about a year ago, uh, and uh, Dave White went out there with his fancy plate loading machine. He measured the pavement before we did the overlay. He did it about a month after we did the overlay and he was out there last month, a year after we put it down. Uh, the report should be coming out on all of this stuff by the end of the year on you know, what are the, the negatives, the positives, the things to think about when designing geotextiles. So uh, there is a publication out about that that Tom Cattler produced just on other agencies' experiences and that's on our website as well. We have a project looking at penetrating sealers. Uh, you know, we often think that if we can buy durability by keeping the water out of the system, that's a good thing.
but which are the good ones and which ones aren't? How do we specify them? So we are wrapping up a research project for Iowa DOT. We're uh, work, again, working with John Kevin. We've been playing with a whole range of products and a whole range of, uh, a whole suite of tests. What the, the tests that seem to be providing us the most useful information on the idea of sorption and desorption. Huh? because it is, seems to be important that a pavement that does absorb water has to be able to release it back out again. Otherwise, you're going to reach saturation and be subject to freeze thaw damage pretty early on. John has done the bulk of the work on this and done some fabulous uh, data. We haven't published anything on it yet, uh, but it will be coming out to the DOT. I think our contract ends at the end of December. <clears throat> All right, the next one I'm getting excited about is the idea of vibration. We do vibration to get rid of segregation, to get the big bubbles out. We want to keep small bubbles in and stop the water moving. One of the things we've finally started to understand, you look at that photograph and you think, honeycomb, it needs more vibration. It's actually the opposite. What's happened in this case is likely that water has been driven away from the vibrator horizontally and has got trapped at the form and has had nowhere to go. Uh, it's a function of the frequency of vibration and the tendency of the mixture to bleed. Uh, this is relatively new. We had a paper published in ACI journal last week, uh, and we're busy trying to round up some money to keep investigating this to, to actually understand the fundamentals a whole lot better. So, you know, we've developing the thought process that under vibration, air goes up, water moves horizontally, basically a bit same action as a squirt gun. That you put pressure behind a drop of water, it'll move horizontally. Uh, so we, we need to work on understanding the parameters behind the vibrator, the energy, the frequency, the amplitude, the dimensions, duration, spatialing. Tie that to the parameters of the mixture, the amount of water in the mixture, the workability of the mixture, the gradation of the mixture, the supplementary cementing materials, and tie those together so that we can develop vibration-proof mixtures and we can provide guidance to the industry to say, this is how much vibration you need and what's good vibration opposed to bad vibration. We've proved pretty categorically that water moves sideways, and that's relatively new. We also know that it drives bubbles upwards, big bubbles first, small bubbles not so much. And that we've always known that, but it was nice to get data to prove it. We're working on a pooled fund as, again, we, we want to be able to provide the feedback, is that as the truck dumps the, the material in front of the paving machine to do a quick and dirty test, which will tell the paver operator, this is what this mixture looks like. This is how fast you have to vibrate. This is how fast you have to drive the paver. And at the same time, it may provide feedback to the batch plant to say, we hate this load. Do a better, better one next time. And this is how to uh, address it. Uh, other research needs. There's a whole lot of stuff out there. Uh, the ones that seem to be getting attention when at the beginning of summer was buckling, when heat temperature started to go up. I know for you, uh, the ability to extend your paving period, you know, uh, when your winter is long you need and your summer is short, you need to be able to pave under more uh, aggressive environments. We need to be able to develop information about that. The other one in cold weather communities is understanding and developing mixtures that can resist the effects of chains and studded tires. Ah, all right, things that other innovations that are happening. Portland limestone cement, big one on the horizon. Got this one from Tim yesterday, uh, guidance on, this is coming, we've got to know how to adopt it. I also saw a survey floating around from the DOTs yesterday that uh, most agencies are quite happy to allow the, the use of limestone cements. So what's the challenge to getting it in place? Is it the ready mix community is nervous about it? Is the paving community doesn't want to change? Is it the DOTs of the barrier? It seems to be a circular argument and we need to figure out what are the real challenges and barriers and uh, keep that one moving. It's a good thing. Recycle co concrete aggregate. Again, we've developed some guidance and some tools. Tara Cavallini is working on another tech, tech brief that'll be coming out soon, as soon as I can get it through the Fed review process. But this isn't new. It may be new in some places, but we can do it and we know how to do it well. Fly ash getting harder and harder to get. 
Uh, Reclaim Fly Ash seems to be the solution. Larry Sada has written a really good tech brief on how to think about that and how industry is starting towards providing us with uh, ash that's been in the ground for some time, but is still perfectly satisfactory. In some ways, with the processing they have to do, it may be more uniform and the quality may be better. <clears throat> Other technologies, all sorts of variations on the dial bar, uh, different coatings, different metals, different materials, different form factors, uh, quite a lot of work going on in that. Mark Snyder is driving this conversation through the ACPA. Pavers themselves have come a long way from the first one built in Iowa in, I think it was 1950 something, to modern day machines. Um, what was intriguing is that the site I was on yesterday, uh, last week, they had one man behind the paver machine with a bull float, and he was not overworked. And that was a sign of a really good process happening. They had the mixture down, they had the quality control processes at the batch plant, that it was the same truckload coming every truck. They had trucks arriving every 55 seconds, and it was the same truck to truck to truck. We had the tools to be able to measure that. We were able to take samples from in front of the paver, do a quick V Kelly test on it, give a thumbs up and say, yep, it's the same old thing. Uh, and the machine itself able to report how fast it's moving to be steered by real-time smoothness, uh, by um, stringless, by, by LIDAR devices mounted up front, um, total stations helping to steer the machine so there's no string line. The machine reporting what vibrators are doing, that they're actually running, how fast they're running, how fast the machine is. Everything is available on that iPad mounted on the side of the paver. Uh, and so the inspectors also don't have to climb up on the machine. They can come to this iPad, tab through the various windows, get the data out, dump it into, uh, and you know, the electronic reporting is at the end of the day, all of this, these data can be dumped into a, a flash drive. You know, the batch plant was handing a flash drive at the end of the day to the engineer to say, here are the batches you got. Same can be done here. So the electronic reporting makes it a whole lot more reliable, a whole lot faster, and a lot safer is that you haven't got people crawling around underneath the paving machine trying to get information. Data about tining and curing. One of the needs in my mind is how do we measure curing? Uh, you know, Chelek or Zolder is saying it's got to be the same color as his white hat. Yeah, that's true, but that we need better than that. So that we need to do better on that. Uh, we have tools available to tell us when to do the, cure, uh, the sawing. And again, instead of it being guesswork, this is an, a, an opportunity that a simple device, uh, take a cylinder, put it next to the paver, come back in a couple of hours, it'll tell you when you need to do the sawing. So I've run a little long, but there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of fun stuff. Are we there yet? Oh, no. My job is secure. Uh, and uh, But um, keep talking to us. The in, Again, that interaction between industry agency and academia to us is important that we can talk sense to each other and make it practical i'm done alan it's all yours perfect thank you very much peter and we definitely will be bothering you for years to come um you won't be retiring anytime soon if <laughs> if uh, we're, we're looking after this um we do have several questions that we can um address i'm just gonna flip it back here Okay, here we go. Uh, I made some notes as uh, you were talking there and our check to you is in the mail as well. So you should see that in the next week or two and there might be some COVID delays, so maybe next year, uh, <laughs> but it is in the mail. Excellent. Um, I wish. And the other point you made was uh, chemistry. Yes, we hate chemistry as civil engineers, um, but we are still seeing scaling issues here in Toronto. That's why Tim and I actually developed the course that's being implemented in November uh, for Ontario specifically. So any kind of research you can provide in terms of scaling would be highly beneficial. All right. There is a PhD out there. So yeah, I'll send you, remind me and I'll send you a copy of it. Perfect. Uh, in terms of the questions, um, when you're actually helping out with uh, PEM, where does the uh, liability lie in terms of developing some of these mixed designs? We are pretty careful to 
you know, as a university, we have no insurance, so we duck liability as hard as we can. It's mm -hmm. still up to the contractor to develop his mixtures and test them. It's still up to the consultant to approve them and whatever that relationship they have. What we're simply doing is providing a tool to say, here, go and try this in your tr first trial batch. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, um, that's actually the first time I've had that question. I, I think because here in Canada, we're primarily performance-based. So anytime we, we talk right. about a little bit of prescription, the liability shifts to the ready-mix producer or the owner. Um, so that's just something I wanted to clear up there. And that's actually part of the whole PEM thing is that we're trying to push towards measuring the things that matter. So you know, then, uh, and part of the conversation is when do you measure it? <clears throat> you know, for a typical mainline paving system where the, the batch plant and the contractor are the same entity, it, it's all one person's problem. When you have ready mix delivering, there's a change of ownership somewhere. And, and in a way, we think PEM has helped to answer that because you are measuring at the point of delivery. You're measuring resistivity, you're measuring air void system and workability uh, at the point of delivery. And if they're okay, then the ready mix operator gets paid. If the contractor screws it up after that, that's his own problem. And that's why we're starting to think about what do we measure after it's come through the paper? And that'll be phase two of PEM. <clears throat> Yep, makes sense. Uh, one of the questions in the chat, uh, what do you mean by, when you say aggregate stability? Uh, yeah, I was spinning through that pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> Decracking an alkali silica reaction. So we don't want our aggregates growing in the mixture of a brittle mixture. Um, and you know, for you, decracking is probably not an issue. Where I live, it's a, a significant problem. But for everybody in this continent, Alkali silica reaction is a real issue. Mm -hmm. And on PEM, we've ducked that one by referring to ASTM and the AASHTO standards. And I think CSA standards are very similar to, to those bodies. You've got your own protocol on. In fact, I think ASTM or AASHTO stole theirs from you. <laughs> okay. Um... Talking about uh, curing compounds, do curing compounds provide sufficient... Uh... Oh, I just shifted here. Sufficient curing for high slag pavements? That's a good question. Send me some money and I'll, I'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think they do. You may want to look carefully at the dosage. Um, but, you know, what we're really trying to do is keep the water in the system so that your hydration can proceed. Slag is typically slower than ordinary Portland cement. So you may go a couple of days longer but yeah i think they work uh it's not something that i've explicitly investigated i'd love to send that check so send the check yes it's, it's going to be in the mail as well <laughs> um another question about slag contents um what slag content are you regularly seeing as optimal in concrete mixtures and how high have you tried and got good scaling resistance that's a loaded question. <laughs> there was a project that Doug Hooten and uh, I can't remember, Scott Schlohols did through Iowa State many years ago, where Doug looked at bridge decks. And basically what he demonstrated was that up to 50% slag, you could achieve good performance as long as you got everything else right, including curing, finishing, all of that good stuff. And in all of the samples that Doug took, um, the ones that failed, there was a moderate slag content, but there was also something else that went wrong. Above 50%, I think the risk goes pretty high. So personally, I would say 50 is a maximum. Now, when you say optimized, that depends on what you're optimizing based on cost, workability, availability, blah, 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 blah. Um, but typically in pavements, they're mostly around about 25% here. I've seen a few at 40. And again, if you're paying attention to curing, you don't pave it in November. Um, 
I think you can get pretty good performance. The data that I got, that we got in our lab is that again, above about 40%, the risk starts to go up pretty fast. So yeah, 25, 40s would probably not be unreasonable. Definitely. Um, now in terms of, uh, you mentioned uh, a little bit about PLC use, uh, and, and a lot of the industry is moving to global warming potential numbers for different applications. Are you seeing that in, in the concrete pavement side? Are yeah. consultants specifying GWPs? Uh, I haven't seen it in specifications yet. Uh, the pressure seems to be coming politically and from the press. Every day on my phone, on my newsfeed, I get some article that says concrete is killing the planet because of the CO2 footprint. And mm -hmm. so the cement industry is starting to respond to that. I mean, PCA put out their 2050 zero carbon plan that came out earlier this week. Uh, you came out with your PLC document yesterday. So I, I think the cement industry is starting to respond. The next part of it is to get the agencies to say, we want the stuff. At the moment, they're saying we allow it. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I'm not sure where that barrier is between agency. What, what I'm a little nervous of is that I don't want politicians to say, Thou shalt hit certain CO2 in a, in a in an EPD yet. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. Minnesota DOT had a proposal out a couple of months ago because Minnesota legislature started to say we're going to write the rules, and industry stepped in and said, "Wait, give us a chance to write the rules." Um, and they had an RFP out on looking for help on how to write an EPD and how to collect the data for a good EPD without making everything impossible. Now they haven't awarded that contract. I was one of the people that bid for it. So I kind of hope I get it. Okay. So hopefully we get some more information because here in Canada, the federal government is already mandating, you know, type three EPDs and we're slowly moving there in the next couple of years. So I just wanted to see if that's part of the pavement side as well. One of the challenges with pavements or slip form pavements, again, if you're using a central batch plant, the PCR at the moment, I think, says you have to have six months of data in your EPD. Now, no central batch plant is on a site for more than about two months. Yeah. So it, it becomes a catch-22. It's impossible to collect the data. So we've got to figure that one out. Definitely. And we'll take one more question. We're pretty much out of time here. Um, have you done any research or are you aware of any research that ties into uh, scaling and mortar flaking and accelerators? No, that's an intriguing thought. Um, so the, saying the thing that, it... that immediately springs to mind, the one rule of thumb is that any time that you accelerate a mixture, whether you do it chemically with heat, um, whatever tool you use to make it, hydrate faster, you end up with a higher permeability. And this is, you know, Rachel Detweiler did this work in Norway back in the 80s. So, you know, in a way I would suspect that accelerators will hurt scaling resistance fundamentally because you've got higher permeability. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll wait for that check and we'll check it out. <laughs> Perfect. That's pretty much all the questions we have. Again, thank you a lot, Peter, for all your time. I know you're very busy. You told us you had, what, this is the fourth or fifth presentation you've done. Um, uh, if you are available, I'd like to see a webinar on the uh, kitty litter and diapers and concrete. Um, we can schedule <laughs> one. one. Look in the recordings. I think we did one as part of a Tuesday. I'll yeah. send you the link. Perfect. We can share it with our audience. But again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate your insight and all the research and great work you're doing at the CP Tech Center. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And if you do have any questions, you can follow up with myself or Peter directly. His contact information is on his website. So again, thank you, Peter, for a lot for your time and uh, have a great day. You too. Thanks for the opportunity. See you all. Take care, everyone. Bye.